Lisa Michaud, um, uh, Dew Drop Road in Thamesville, Ontario. Um, well, we live on a just under 13 acre hobby farm with uh, 10 acres of bush on our property. And the turbines, there are eight of them pretty much in a row, you know, the way they're situated. And it's 1.14 kilometers from our home, not from our property line, but from our, our house itself. My husband and myself, um, I have a 26-year-old daughter and a 22-year-old son. And uh, we have four dogs, a cat, and we did have a whole herd of goats and chickens, peacocks and all that. But we've sold off almost all of the goats. We've only got three left. Because of the wind turbines, yeah, the goats didn't, they were very, very much affected by them. Um, we'd come out in the middle of the night and they'd be standing out in the middle of the of the pasture, not even under shelters with their babies. It was just, um, they, we didn't know what it was at first. They were standing out in the bush, like at the edge of the bush, staring back that way. And we thought, well, maybe there was a coyote or, you know, some form of predator that was spooking them, but there was never anything. So whenever it was really windy, they wouldn't go into the barn unless we, you know, coax them in with some food or, or something. So, mm -hmm. which is unusual because they don't like the inclement weather. Well, they started, um, testing them mid-April, near the end of April, and then they were fully functioning shortly after that, By they say by the 1st of May, but by the 3rd of May, 2nd of May, I was in the hospital in the ER with severe vertigo, and then it stayed, it, 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 uh, it, it was bad for probably a, a couple of weeks, and then it slowly, you know, diminished, and then it would come back again, and yeah. It, it was kind of in stages, my husband was a few weeks after me, and, uh, and then my son was shortly after that with varying degrees of the same symptoms and severity and all that. So, and then eventually my daughter, she didn't, she worked out of the home a lot, so she noticed it, but she didn't put it to the same as what, you know, the same extent because she thought it was allergies or, you know, just she was tired from work or whatever. She didn't really understand that it was, you know, part of this that we were going through see my husband and my son they do renovations and so they don't go to the same job site all the time and when they're working in a home that is surrounded by turbines they're affected double and then they come home and there's no rest from it so they notice if they're working somewhere else for a week they worked um, in a totally different area up near Wallaceburg where there's no turbines yet they're on the way but they weren't there yet and when my son stepped outside to have his lunch break and he was just sitting there, and you know, there's your regular cars going by and everything, but he's like, it's quiet. And that hit him so profoundly that it was quiet. Like we all are experiencing various, like I said, various degrees of health issues. The, one of the main most devastating one is this lack of sleep because there's this constant buzzing in your ears. There's this constant hum going on, things that, and then when you can hear them and when you can't hear them, there's just this barrage that's hitting you all the time. And when you don't sleep, you know, you're no good the next day at work. Um, and when they're dizzy in that and trying to work on ladders and things, it's, it's just not, not safe. Uh, when you have to pull over to the side of the road to vomit because the vertigo is so bad. Um, it's just a lot of things like that. So it just makes it very difficult to earn a living. Um, with those kind of things and then you know when you're yeah you know, they're the guys guys are take it harder than women I think because women are used to being nauseous and whatnot but when the, you know when they have to miss a day's work you know they're sick when when it's that bad um, the other thing my son and my husband well my son has gone to for vertigo testing and then he went back to to talk to the audiologist afterwards and he is sending him back to see the, the actual doctor who did the vertigo testing to speak with them and and we talked to the the first audiologist and he said because I, I said well my husband's got it myself and I went into a bit of a history and he said it needs to be investigated because it's not he said he could understand if mother child but your spouse is not physically related to you there's a biological difference so he said there's obviously an environmental problem that needs to be investigated in order to uncover whatever this is that we've been going through. Now, my doctor won't send me, so I don't know. Uh, my husband's got an appointment for him to go to see the same set of physicians. So, you know, when that happens, 
I'm sure that will be helpful. We heard about the project in 2009 at the very last open house meeting that Suncor had that we didn't uh, know they were coming before that. We had only received a letter a few days prior to that last meeting and and like I said it wasn't even addressed to us it said occupant so you know that usually goes in the in the garbage that kind of mail we don't always take the time to look at it but I happened to that time and found that out and we you know we asked questions and we were concerned but it really wasn't in the forefront of worry for us until they actually you know started bothering us well we did contact um, trying to think we first contacted the site manager that I had his information from that first meeting that we went to and I sent them him an email and he said that he would pass it along and at that time I didn't you know didn't remember or didn't know that Suncor was the um, the people in charge so after another email about probably about three weeks to a month later I sent this fellow another email and said you know look I'm still having problems now my husband's starting to have problems um, you know who can we what do we do who do we talk to and at that time he sent me back another email saying that he would forward it again and he mentioned both Suncor and the MOE but at the time I didn't know who the MOE was <laughs> <laughs> so, and that sounds kind of silly, but I know I've said that before, but, you know, he just said, you know, contact Mo, and I didn't know who Mo was, and um, once I started looking into it, then I realized to, you know, Ministry of the Environment, and I called, you know, that number, and I really didn't know what to do from there, you know, we just, um, and I spoke, I, I sent an email to Suncor, but I, I couldn't, um, this fellow that I sent it to him, he said he would forward it, and then I didn't hear anything. So I took it upon myself to look on the internet who this Suncor was, and and I found their general inquiries email address. So I sent a letter to that address, and they, um, you know, within a few, I would say within a week. Well, I received a letter from and she was, you know, I didn't know what, form of office she held in Suncor but um, you know she said that she would come and she would be in contact and she would come and see us and I thought well you know wow you know you don't usually get a response from a company uh, when you're complaining about something they don't you know come to your door and talk to you so you know I was very surprised that she came and I you know, I was reluctant to talk to the different wind groups. I wasn't associated to any of the wind groups. I didn't know who any of them were, other than the one lady that I had saw, you know, standing outside in 2009. And I remembered her name and I, you know, I contacted her to find out a little bit more. But I was still very reluctant, you know, in trusting well, who of these people are, am I going to talk to? Because you don't, you know, you just don't know. So, you know, I was very reluctant. Uh, we hadn't contacted a lawyer yet at that time or anything. Um, this lady came to our home with someone else and she pretended like she didn't hear them and it was it was really bad that weekend and I was very off balance and everything and and had we had had a big anniversary party that weekend and you know I was sick for the whole thing and it was awful and she pretended like she couldn't hear them outside but the young man that was with her, he agreed, and he says, oh yeah, you can hear that. And then after he agreed, then she agreed that she could hear them. You know, she kind of pretended that she didn't. And then we had a long discussion after that, and they weren't going to do anything to help us. They, they couldn't. No, no, they, I asked them how they, you know, if there was any way that they could help us. I said, because, you know, if we have to move, no one is going to buy our home. Um, you know, because if people are beginning to you know, not, they're more so now, I think, but back then they weren't, you know, they were just starting to, you know, listen a little bit. And we knew that our house wouldn't sell for the price that we needed to obtain from it. And I, I said that to her, like, who is going to buy our home with these things behind us if we're having a problem? And she said, special people who like wind farms will buy our home. And I'm like, well, who are these special people? You know, and how how is anyone going to, like, how, how can we get help to, to get out of this problem that we're in? Can you find us a property like this in southwestern Ontario with a hobby farm where there are no wind turbines that are going to go up? And she couldn't answer that question, you know. Now, I have called the MOE 
you know, I would say hundreds of times, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not thoroughly accurate that I've, I've documented every time I called them. And a lot of times I, in the beginning, I started calling the Windsor office and then that person would say, well, don't call this number, call this, call the spills line. And then the spills line would say, well, don't call us in the middle of the day because, you know, and then why are you calling us at night? Because we're in Toronto, we can't help you. You know, we can write it down. And some of them were very nice and very thorough and others were very rude. And then speaking to the Windsor office a numerous times after that, the position kept changing. There wasn't always the same person you'd speak to. They were no longer in that role. You know, somebody else would take over. And one young woman did come out once. I wasn't home, my husband was home. But it was in the middle of the afternoon with no wind. And she basically said, there's nothing I can do. And, you know, when we started having our well water problems uh, last December, um, we spoke to the Windsor office, who then put me in touch with the London office. Uh, the fellow who was in charge of the wells situation knew all about our well and everything, knew exactly when it was dug, how much water it produced, when it was, you know, knew everything about our well. And he said, well, the wind turbines don't affect well water because they're just in a little cement pad floating, on, you know, in the dirt. And I'm like, no, they use pylons. He says, oh no, they don't use pylons. We had somebody else that was trying to tell us that their well water was affected and, and we said no because they don't use pylons. So somewhere out there, there was somebody else experiencing the same problem we were who was just flushed over, you know, not, not taken seriously. And the only, re the only way, and he spoke to Suncor, and the only way that they would help us is if we put the money out first to have someone check our well, pull our pump and check everything to make sure that there wasn't a mechanical problem. Well, we knew there wasn't a mechanical problem. We could hear the pump running. My husband poured gallons and thousands of gallons of water down into the well so we would have water. And we had pails to flush the toilet. And this was last December. Well, nobody has money at that time of year to, to pay someone to come out and check these things. So, you know, we were just living the best we could. And they would not do anything until we could prove that it was, you know, so once again, the victim is, is, is left to prove themselves against this corporation. We have approached uh, our MPPs and they've been amazing in, in, you know, becoming more vocal against wind turbines, bringing the issue to the forefront. We, I sent letters uh, to federal government and provincial government and there was nothing that they could do at this time to help us. I sent a letter, two letters to the ombudsman and they said that the, uh, the situation didn't warrant further investigation at this time. So I'm thinking, okay, if you're not there to protect us, who is? And then finally, reluctantly, I decided to make an appointment with our mayor, but that took a couple of emails, uh, one final harsh email in order to get him to listen so that we could have a meeting with him. And that did not go over very well because he is, he outright said, he approved the project behind my home and there's nothing wrong with it and the crazies that are speaking up against it shouldn't be coming to his office so you know that's just not right there's no avenue we I've written I've written letters to public health I've tried to talk to my family physician and um, she because that was because we have a lawsuit pending against Suncor she will not send me or have me have any kind of health, provide any kind of health care that might benefit me with regards to my lawsuit. So she won't send me to an ENT to have the ears, the pressure, the, the vertigo, any of the problems that I'm experiencing, she will not send me for testing because she thinks that I only want that for my lawsuit. Um, Within our community, people are, anyone that we speak to, they're very much on our side, but they're not willing to come forward being on our side, you know, but they are, they're, they're, you know, whatever we can do for you, more or less verbally in that sense, you know, they're supportive, but I don't know how many of them would actually take up a picket sign or, you know, do any of that. And people that are actually suffering, they don't want to say anything. So um, people like our friends and stuff, well, they don't want to hear about it anymore. Or even some of them very much, you know, distanced themselves from us in the beginning. You know, they were just saying we were making it up, you know. 
So, yeah, it's very it's odd. Because it is such, they have, the companies themselves have branded it so well. It's in our schools, it's in on packaging, it's in our advertisement, it's everywhere that green is good. You see this wind symbol and you automatically think it's good. And I think that that is, you know, we, they are so, they've been so brainwashed to believe that if we don't have these wind turbines, you know, we're not going to have light in our schools. We're not going to have light in our homes. But the opposite is true because the more money that we put out for this farcical situation, then the more risk that we are going to have to be living that way because we're not going to be able to afford to pay our mortgages and pay our hydro bills and our heat bills and everything. And the industry is going to keep leaving our area because they can't afford these high prices and more people will be jobless. And people around here just haven't woken up and accepted that. You know, they do so much that harms their community and don't, and then they, and they, you know, they blame whatever reason, the government or whatever, but then they're not empowering themselves to do something about it. Mm -hmm. power um, the power surges were sometimes numerous in one day and, or, I mean, weekly or just constant, like, there were micro surges where just your lights would flash and things like that. But then there were intense surges where you'd come home and all the, everything was reset because you knew it had gone off. All the way to the fact that we burnt out three Bell PVR units because of the computers inside fried from the constant power surges. Mm -hmm. Because they can't take that, that constant power surge. Um, what, cordless phones in our house. We've gone through uh, two sets or three sets of cordless phones and they just stop working. They can't get that signal. They stop, they're constantly searching or you go to pick it up and it's um, computer, Xbox, a number of different things, fried, you know. Yes. There's nothing you can do unless you are vocal. I mean, the more vocal, the more the word gets out, the more people, you know, try to understand. I mean, otherwise we're just, you know, they're just giving it to us and we're taking it and, and we can't live our lives like that. People shouldn't have to be chased from their home. They shouldn't have to feel like they're a refugee in their own country. They shouldn't, you know, be subjected as a guinea pig to these type of situations. I mean, this is a devastating way to live and change of your life. It's, it's just not right. And I think unless people take up that and empower themselves to learn more, you know, you have to be not naive like we were. You have to inquire and read and do whatever you can to prevent them from coming. They need to stop what they're doing and, you know, really step back and look at what they're doing and figure out, well, okay, if this many people are starting to complain, if this many people are having problems and illnesses and, and I mean, they're, there is a reality here that's, that's, a, that's an honest truth that they're not looking at, and they need to. Uh, they can't just have a couple people that are fighting for it against each other, and they can't just use it as a political um, place to stand, you know, and say, well, you know, we're going to make things better. They have to mean it, and they have to stop it and, and really help people who are, are in need, because, I mean, you know, we shouldn't be alone in our country trying to fight this. It's, it's just not right.